Welcome to Suffolk Matters, where all of Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News, opinions, and insights you won't hear anywhere else. Here's your host, the president of New York's largest independent union, Suffolk AME's Dan Leveler. Welcome to another edition of Suffolk Matters on Walk 97.5 and 94.3 The Shark, where Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News and views you can't hear anywhere else. So my guest this morning is Jerry Larracuta. He's the president of CSEA Region 1 for Long Island. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Dan. Hey, a couple times we've done this, and I love this radio. You're doing a great job, by the way. I appreciate it. You know, it's, it's great to have you as a guest also because we have so much in common, and, uh, and, and our, I guess our work and worldviews really align, so our conversations tend to be pretty easy and casual. Yeah, I mean, it's like talking to uh, my friend, my brother, whatever. It's yeah. like we just sit down and talk, and it's great because um, I hate scripted things and people can tell when things are scripted. sure so yeah, we're not yeah. scripted we're yeah. just us right that's the yeah. way to do it so i want to just real quick i just want people to know again uh for anyone unfamiliar what it is csea is and and what it is you do for them okay so the csea pretty much is a mirror of what you do now if you go on a statewide level we're very large right we're close to three hundred thousand. that's the uh, reported membership from all the way from Buffalo to Watertown down to uh, Westchester and then in my, uh, the whole Long Island. Sure. Long Island is Region 1. Yes. It's a huge union, but I like to just stick to Region 1. And actually, I came for 16 years. I was the local president in Nassau County. Yes. So that was where I really mirrored you. We, we did exactly the same job. Right. You represent every Suffolk County worker, right? Yeah, yeah. Other than police and corrections. Sure. I represented every county worker in Nassau other than police and corrections. So um, it's a very, very, I found it to be, you're doing exactly pretty much what I did. And it's the only way, because when I first started in 2005, or in my first election, I was lucky enough to get elected four times to that job. Uh, but nobody knew what CSA was. Nobody. Right. And we started working the media and yep. getting on TV and getting on radios. And you know what? Over the years, it really, really worked. It, 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 we taught them. People would say, oh, I didn't know Crossing Guards was CSA. They didn't even know what, in the beginning, they didn't even know what CSEA was. Right. And then we had that little tune, CSEA, you know, we work for you. And I used to have kids in supermarkets singing it to me. So <laughs> it was pretty cool. We make sure that the essential workers that keep people, the behind the scenes, they work for a lot of them. And without them, people on Long Island's lives and the quality of lives would be 100 degrees less. It would be terrible. Absolutely. Our workers, your yeah. workers and my workers, our, yep. our members... They keep the, the residents on Long Island very, very uh, well fed, as they say. Yeah, yeah. it's very funny to me how uh, essential went to uh, unskilled labor in mm. a matter of months. Yeah, the whole happened. world could shut down with just the very basic of needs. You know, I mean, food production and distribution massively, massively necessary. Right? There's the saying: "There's no place in the world that's less than three meals away from a riot," oh, and yeah. yet the people that produce. And, and distribute our food and get it to us, uh, they're, they're considered, what, unskilled? They were the ones producing when everyone else was ordered to hunker down. Yeah. They were out there exposing themselves yes. in every way. I mean, look at the grocery store, guys. Mm -hmm. You know, John Darso, um, the president of Long Island Fed, but he's also the local president of 338. Yeah. And uh, 338 is all the grocery stores. Yeah. Them guys, I think they were the biggest heroes because... I remember going to them, and you know, the, of course, some were wearing masks, some were not ma wearing masks, and they exposed themselves. They had a high rate of infection. Those folks that sure. worked in those stores, True. and they still sh they were open every day. Yeah, and they had to deal with stuff they never had to deal with before, right? Because you weren't at that point, you weren't just a grocery worker. You were also on the front line, so to speak, making sure that people were social distancing, wearing their masks, that everybody was. You know, polite to each other under pressure. These are like new skills that they weren't necessarily hired for. And, or trained for. So you're right. right. Uh, you right. know, it absolutely meant, well, listen, we went through historical times. Um, I think the new norm, as they like to call it, is, is coming around pretty soon. And um, there are people that were born, you know, in January uh, of 2020 and after Mm -hmm. that will never know the life you and I knew. Never see right. it. They'll never know what it's like to go to a baseball game without being asked if they have a, a vaccination, if they're wearing a mask. Life has changed here. World has changed. I don't think changed. it's going to go back right. anytime soon. 
Yeah. Well, you know, it's our job to make sure it changed for the better. You know, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and this might seem like an odd connection to make, but, you know, I think more and more people see, and, and, you know, it's really just, I guess with the advent of the internet, it becomes real easy to find out what's going on in other places in the world and what's happening to other workers across the country and everything else. And it's clear that there's class warfare, where people who, you know, I, I, I did the analysis the other day. If you made 500 bucks an hour, were born in 0 BC, right? Uh, you know, yeah. literally... Like the me. the year Christ came along, <laughs> you made five hundred an hour on a forty hour work week, spent none of that money, accumulated the whole thing. You know, you just squirrel away your coins in a in a tree or a, a chest or whatever, and lived all the way to today. You would still have less money than some of the like the, like, like those top ten billionaires. Oh yeah, it is it is to me it's it's tremendous. But additionally, you see kind of an attitude, you know, something that we saw pre-pandemic and, and, and maybe has shifted a little in the world now. But the fact of the matter is uh, there was always this idea that, you know, well, why do we need labor unions? You know, there's laws that protect us. And we saw it during the coronavirus and that whole the pandemic and the ensuing uh, financial crisis behind it. All of a sudden, those laws started eroding. There were several states that threw out their child labor laws. You know, you'd learn about it in school and be like, there's no way. I, you know, I can't even imagine why things were like that back in the 1800s or whatever else. What's well, happening in this country now, right? Labor rights erode the second very rich people can't get as much money as they want. Now, those very rich people doubled their profits while many people are on the brink of failure, right? So, but I, but I just, I just want to talk about just conceptually the, the erosion of labor rights and, and how I see sometimes that happens. You know, if we don't have organized labor and there's no job protection saying, you know, you, you work a five-day work week and that's that, eventually some company is going to realize I can get somebody to work a sixth day and not pay them anymore. I'm just going to adjust their hourly rate and they're going to do that or they're going to starve. And now everyone else in that business has no choice but to follow suit. Even if they don't morally like the idea, they can't be competitive. They can't keep their doors open. I think you're right. I think, I think what we're doing is we're sliding backwards. Yeah. You know, back in the 1920s when people lost their lives for this labor movement, you know, they had wars and riots and fistfights and uh, fires. And they, you know, some, many got arrested and, and quite a few died. Uh, yeah. to get our rights where they are, to get the right to organize. And, um, and, and it was because of greed by the, by the wealthy. That's it. I mean, sure. you know, if they took in $100,000, they wanted to keep 99000 and take the other 1000 and split it up amongst uh, 500 people. And yeah. it was peanuts for them. But they, and that, was, that would continue to be happening today if not for organized labor. You talk about that greed, and, and you talk about the way businesses and especially these very large corporations, the way they operate, it's profits first, right? And so you can say, or at least I can say from my perspective, that's organized greed. And the only answer really is organized labor in response to that organized greed. But I want to talk about, there's, uh, there's a municipality out in Suffolk uh, that is now engaged in telling its workforce it wants them to work an extra half hour. And that's that. And their reason being, well, like other people work the extra half hour in other places, but the fact of the matter is you had an agreement that was in place that said, these are your hours. Now you want to change those hours. There has to be, you know, I mean, in the labor movement, we call that a mandatory subject of bargaining. Right. Uh, and, and, and to me, that was, that was a shocking headline to see. That's another kind of greed. That's called, um, well, let me see. I never thought about what kind of uh, category that would go on. But I've dealt with that t town supervisor before. And that's all about um, enhanced and, uh, and power and authority. This guy's been there a long time. Right. He doesn't feel anything he says or does, especially with labor, is going to affect that. Um, he's well-liked by the residents. And he's got an anti-labor attitude from day one. I'll never forget, when I first got into this office in March of 20, my first conversation with any elected officials was with him, with uh, Ed Romain. Right. And he wanted to lay off, I don't know, 15, 11 or 15 workers. And I looked it up, and I found out they had a $40 million surplus in the budget. $40 million. I remember. And I said, Ed, before we get into this, 
what are you laying people off for? You have a $40 million surplus. And his answer was so shocking to me. I was actually, for the first time in my life, speechless for like two minutes. <laughs> he said, I don't want to lose my Moody's bond rating. Your bond rating bond is rating more important than, than 15 careers and families and li livelihoods. Yeah. The bottom line is you treat our members like dirt, we'll treat you like dirt. I don't care if you've been around 30 years. I'll do everything I can to keep you from getting 31 years. And that's the way I feel about it. And I will be talking to the press about him. I'm just waiting for my turn. They don't want me to get out there. They're just saying, oh, you know, keep Jerry back. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is all our fight, right? He's an elected official. He's not God. He's an elected right, official. Right. He, we, we, our members put him in there. Right. Our, and our residents put him in there. And he doesn't have the right to just do what he wants. What are you talking about? You're going to make us work a half an hour more and because other towns do it? Well, then, you know what? Other towns do a lot of things we don't do. That's what you call, that's negotiations, right? Right. So negotiate it. That's, that's all. all. That's all anybody's asking for here is to have the ability to sit down and talk it through. You can't demand and somebody to say, hey, listen, you know, because uh, Islip and Huntington, they work till 5. You guys are going to work till 5. Okay, well, am I coming in a half an hour later? No, no, no. You're going to work till... He actually would have the right under certain contracts, to do what I just said. Right. To say, instead of starting at uh, 9, you start at 9.30. But I want you here till 5. Right. Until we work something out in the contract. Right. Would, I think I think under uh, management rights, he would have that sure. up. But that's not but what he's it, saying. Yeah, he's not looking. He's looking to expand hours. And he's looking to expand that hours. Every, that cuts your hourly rate. Neutral. Cuts your overtime yes. rate. It cuts a lot of mm -hmm. your, your life out. That yeah. he does not have the right in this country to do. Right. It's against the, all kinds of laws. I think the Taylor law probably speaks to what he's sure doing. Sure does. And all of the laws that made us unions today. Right. So, you know what, Ed? Good luck with that. And, you know, listen, you know, I, I see any attack on any labor as an attack on all of labor. It is. Because it's that leapfrog effect, right? Okay, well, we push this this group of workers down. Now let's try and get these groups, you know, and then and they work their way around. And so, especially in the municipal world, we're hypersensitive to some of the things that go on with other municipalities because that idea may then find its way to Suffolk County, and then you know that's our fight again. So it's it it's never been for me. You know, let's see what happens to those guys. It's always this is happening to us, all of us. So oh, it is. It's what they do to one. We're just different names, but you know, AIM, CSCA. Yeah. But we are in this 100% together, and we have the same responsibilities, and uh, and we have to protect our members in the same way and manner. Sure. And we will. So you know, I want to talk a little bit about an issue uh, we see in Nassau and something we're dealing with in Suffolk, and that's you know, crossing guards. And I don't think it ends at crossing guards, right? There's a lot of different titles that we're finding. Folks just don't want to take the jobs. Right, and we're we're tying it back to in the conversations we're having. They're saying, "Listen, the, the, the pay and the benefits aren't there. It's not worth it to me." And what it really comes down to, in 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 our way of looking at the world, is the communication of value by management. Management saying, "Hey, we need crossing guards. They keep kids safe. They're valuable to the community." There's so many so many things. A couple of weeks ago, we had a nice conversation with uh, two of our crossing guards. And they explained all sorts of things that they do that, you know, you just wouldn't think that they do. Uh, but at the end of the day, all of these jobs, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, saying I'd like to be a crossing guard. It's also, can I keep the lights on, right? And, and right. we're seeing in Suffolk that there's a problem there. And we've been working with management to get that resolved. I think we have uh, a pretty good plan moving forward. But my understanding is Nassau as well, we're seeing the same issue. We never did until about 10 years ago when we had a police com commissioner and we had Ed Mangano was the uh, county executive. Mm -hmm. And he uh, joined forces with the, with the then police commissioner, uh, Tom Crumter. Yeah. And they decided to make, we had all of our crossing guards. We had no part-timers. Mm -hmm. Even though they only worked, we, the minimum they could work was 20 hours. Actually, right. that's supposed to be the maximum they would work. But right. anything over that wasn't overtime because it wasn't 40 hours. It was just more money. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But because of the job, because even though you they only physically work 20 hours, they're married to that crossing. They start at 7 o'clock in the morning. Yep. They got to come back some of them in midday, and they definitely have to be there at the end of school. Sure. So from 7 to 3 every day, you're married. You can't go, you know, you know part-time is a part-time. They say, well, they're part-time. No, no. When I'm part-time, if I get off at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm going out to Montauk, and I'm, having, I'm going to go meet somebody and have some drinks. You can't do you that can't. as a crossing guard. No. So your right. life is married to that crossing. So that's why we call them full, full time on a reduced work schedule. Right. Yeah. And uh, that worked for about forty years. Mm -hmm. 
And they were very happy. They were my best unit. Right. When they started, they found a clause somewhere in our contract that said we have the right to uh, hire part-time crossing guards. We couldn't believe it. I never knew what was in there. Right. And I got to tell you, that was the beginning of the end. Today, we're down to probably one-third of the crossing guards are left are full-timers. And the other, now we had 300 and, I'm sorry, 400 almost, close to 400 crossing guards. Mm -hmm. And they were all full-time. Mm -hmm. Today, we probably have about 300 crossing guards. And 100 of them are full-time. And 200 of them are part-time. And like you said, retaining the part-timers is very difficult. There's no benefits. See, that's the problem. See, in Suffolk, it's a part-time job, but you're correct. You're married to that post. So even if you're not physically there the whole day, that's where your responsibilities lie, and your day has to be uh, formulated around that. Uh, but you do get full-time benefits. But you do? In Suffolk? In Suffolk, you get the full-time well, benefits. Good for you, because that's what we had, and they took it away. Yeah, and I got to tell you, it's it's a big problem. So, you know, the rate of pay in Nassau is a little higher for a crossing guard, but no benefits. Not easy to get people. The rate in Suffolk is a little low, but has benefits. Very, very hard to get people. And it's, again, it all just comes back to communicating that value. And it really does come back to... It comes back, back to, to respect, too, because a sure. lot of police departments in... I don't know. I shouldn't say that. Let me just say, I know in Nassau County, I can speak specifically, for many years, the civilian workers always got stepped on. It was all about the cops, and the civilians didn't really get treated fairly. That was in Nassau. I changed that a little bit. Not just me, my team. And right. I, we worked with the commissioners and said, look, look, show you the difference. How is it that this guy, can, this officer can do that, and my person that works eight hours a day can't do that? And we were able to change certain things, the way we sign in. Sure. Okay? Well, it's all cops, you know, the police are muster, so they don't have to sign in. But yet, if my uh, employee, if my member is three minutes late and swipes in, they, they add those three minutes up. When it gets to that quarter of an hour, they, they deduct it. They deduct it. I'm like, you can't do that. There's the communication and value again, right? right? This is, you know, these are people we care about. These are people we don't. And that's problematic, right? And I think that's why I say I don't think it's just going to be crossing guards. Uh, there are a number of other titles that we're aware of right now with a civil service list where people pay money. They go on their own time. They take a test. They pass the test. Now there's hundreds of people on the list, and departments will send out to those folks saying, we'd like to hire you. Do, would you like a job? And nobody responds. It's crickets. We're getting, yeah, we're getting through hundreds I'm and hundreds a lot of, of that people. Suffolk County lately. Yes, a lot. and again, it, it, it's communicating value. If you well, what say, are they doing with, why not? I mean, in Nassau, they probably after two years of that same it's this situation and still going on. Sure. I finally said, I can't believe it. I find out that the reason we're not hiring people goes right back to the source. Civil service. They have understaffed. Yeah. Oh, if right. they're going to have civil service understaffed, they can't process the right. applications. That's pretty darn bad. I don't know what the problem in Suffolk is. Uh, is it staffing? We don't know. So, well, you know, partly in Suffolk, staffing has suffered for the last 10 years or so, right? And that was all monetary constraints. Uh, and people were being asked to do more with less. And now it's almost become a norm. So now when someone is coming into a job, we finally have, you know, some funding and we're able to hire some people. But the norm is to say, now you're going to come in and for this amount of money, you're going to be doing the work of three people. And listen, when you've been doing it for 10 years, you're like, this is just how it is. You know, institutionalization, I don't want to say Stockholm syndrome, but you could say that. Hmm. Uh, and uh, someone with fresh eyes from the outside is saying, this is not worth it at all. There's no way I could possibly do this. Right. So and this, is, this has been ongoing conversations with me and, and management in Suffolk County. They recognize that there's a, a number of things that we have to look at. And we, we have planned and scheduled meetings to address these things. And there was budget carve out specifically set aside this year to make sure that we could address some of these issues. But I think it's I think it's just going to keep spreading, right? I think people, you know, going back to the earlier part of the conversation, you know, for all you can say negative about the internet, there's still access to a lot of information, and you can see the abuses uh, that people have to endure. And and when you feel like it's just you, and you're like, is it just me, or is like, is it weird that work is this way, or whatever? But then when you have whole communities of people coming together from across the country saying this is, you know, they talk about it now. It's a great resignation. Right. And then they tried to rebrand it as the uh, the great sabbatical. Right. The implication is, you know, everybody's just taking a couple of weeks off and then they're going to rush back to work. But I think there are people that are so utterly frustrated with the wage, uh, the wage gap in this country and and with the class warfare that we're seeing that enough's enough. 
Yeah, and there is another, you're right, there's another take to this, too. I, I tell uh, parents mostly, but every now and then I'll, I spoke last night, matter of fact, at the facility. You've heard of BOCES. Yeah. We have some yeah, yeah. BOCES mm-hmm. and NASA BOCES. Mm-hmm. We represent the workers there. And um, besides the fact that, of course, management treats our workers far less than they teach, they, they uh, deal with the teachers. The teachers get everything, and, the, and, our, and our support staff gets the crumbs. And that's been a longstanding history in, in all of our school districts, most of them anyway. Right. But the one thing I do tell parents is, listen, not every kid is, is college material. Not everybody will do well in college. Give them a trade. Yeah. I got a news for you. I think in 10 years... A licensed plumber will be making more than a doctor. Might be. Because there are none. It might just be. I'm telling you, if you listen, people, if you listen to this outside, uh, and, you know, you got children that are getting to that point and they get close to graduating high school, OCs. Because if not OCs, any trade, get a trade, get become a plumber, electrician, a carpenter, a welder. Uh, they're making tons of money now. And in about 10 years, they're going to name their own price because nobody... This, ne- this last generation is all about high tech and that kind of schooling. Sure. They're not getting their hands dirty. Right. And you're right. It's kind of like a big multifaceted issue about class warfare and nobody wants to be seen as lower. Their hands are stuck in dirt and grease. Right. Those guys are going to be making about $1,000 an hour, if not more, yeah. in 10 years. So. Well, I'll tell you, the local 200 guys, they do the work. They get in there. They do you know all this plumbing work. They get in there and they do that. But I can tell, like, when I when I was working for the county and not in this capacity, I would be on union or non-union jobs. If you got the government contract you were in, you were doing the work, it was whoever was in, prevailing wage. Um, but the local 200 guys, you could tell the difference. Yeah. They were they were relaxed. They were professional. They understood. And they weren't, they weren't fearing for their next paycheck, right? right. Sometimes on these non-union company sides, you know, you, you're basically at will. You come in, you may do just as good a job as the local 200 guy. You're not getting paid anywhere the same. And the moment's notice, the boss doesn't like... You have an argument. The, the way, right, you have an argument. He doesn't like the way you showed up. You seem a little tired. You know, enough of you, you're gone. I'll get somebody else. And some of us do it age, too. You know, Ageism, huge somebody issue. Somebody gets into their 50s mm-hmm. and, uh, oh, forbid they hit their 60s. And the next thing you know, they want to bounce you because you're making a lot of money. You do it. You know the trade better than anybody by then. Yep. Right, you know, or especially plumbing. Plumbing's a dark art. What do I call it? Black art, dark art. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where you know, it's you can read all the books you want. Mm-hmm. Go try and fix that drain. And it, if you don't know the little tricks that they know, right, it isn't going to work. Yep, <laughs> they, they're worth it. The, listen, they're worth the money because we all need plumbing. We all need yeah. electric in our house, and they're going to. So I think it's a good idea. You're right. Um, I wonder how that's going to pan out down the road. I mean, hopefully, I'm still around. I like to see that. At when um, people that were looked down upon at one time are now, you know, they're running the roost. You yeah. Know, they'll, they'll be more important to people than stockbrokers. Sure. <laughs> and listen, you know, I mean, that's partly our job as well. You know, we have to make that happen, right? We have to yeah. make sure that people understand, hey, listen, you know, look, again, like we were talking about earlier, if there isn't that workforce in the grocery store, again, three meals away from a riot. Right, and those grocery store workers. That you remember the going do... in the stores and all the shelves. Remember that, right? The empty, the yeah. Shelves were empty. You mm-hmm. couldn't find toilet paper. You couldn't find anything. And then they would say, oh, "It's coming in tomorrow at two o'clock." Right. And lines out the doors. I, my office is next to Costco. Right. I got to tell you, it was unbelievable for about six months. The line, mm-hmm. people waiting with carts, mm-hmm. went about five, six hundred feet yeah. out all the way. Showing up hours before the place opens. I was every morning. I would get into go to my job and I would be passing at least three, four, five hundred people online waiting for the, the doors to open up. Yeah. That's crazy. I go I back that to that. happens again. Yeah. No, I go back to that saying, you know, uh, the saying is nowhere in this world is there more than three meals away from a riot. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. And so it's, it's just, all of this is very important. But, you know, we've gotten we've gotten into a bunch of things that we wanted to talk about. But I, I really did want to get your take on uh, on on the state budget and, and how that's looking uh, from your perspective. I got to be a little careful on the state budget. I think mm-hmm. the state budget's looking pretty good so far, better than it has in 30 years, maybe. Um, however, my state workers are out of a contract mm-hmm. and we need to get that contract signed. So. Um, yeah, I think Kathy Hochul is doing a pretty darn good job so far. She's, uh, you know, new, but not really. She's been around a long time, and she came from Region 6 in my area, which yeah. is all the way up in Buffalo, mm-hmm. area. And she actually knew a lot of our leaders from Region 6, um, 
and Mary, our, our current president, they know each other. All that being said, it, it's going to come down to a contract for us because the state workers are not happy. They've been, as you said, they've been uh, overlooked for decades. Right. Between Cuomo and his father mm -hmm. and even Pataki, i got to say. So they make very little money. And it's, it's a very, you know, you see those guys out plowing snow all winter long yeah. up in Region 5 and yeah. 6 and even, uh, even in Albany area, right? They don't get paid anything. You get, you pay very little. And that's as front line as you get. Yep. Everything's shut down if the roads are shut down, right? How are you going to get products to and from? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's as essential as you get. So and, the, what's the same? Money talks and then... Uh, something you know, else. And then, less and I don't know. The whole thing is just, you know, show us the money and let's get it done. If she really cares, and that's what we're hoping for because I got we have about 75,000 state workers. Right. In the CSEA. And uh, they're not happy right now. They might be... They don't care about budgets. These are real working people. Right. Working the streets. Working the streets. They care yeah. about the budget in their pocket. That's 100%. And they're, they're out, and they're out working on behalf of everyone else to keep the lights on. Thank you. Yeah. They go to work. Uh, our state workers and many of your workers go to work with this weight on their shoulder every morning. They're dealing with their own personal problems. They get in a car and they're driving to work and they're saying, even if I work every day this week, even if I work a little bit of overtime, I'm not going to make enough money to cover the nut keep my house going right it's always i'm going to still fall behind that's a horrible feeling horrible yeah no i, I and that's again that's what we're here for what, what, you, what your capacity is what my capacity is find these issues address these issues and get them get them changed yeah, you know absolutely. so and that's you know again you talk about you're doing it i know you're doing it you're, you're in there you're in you're in the trenches and uh, thank god we need that and, yeah uh, you know you represent the same kind of workers same workers that we do and uh thank you yeah. No, no, listen, I, you know, again, we, we keep in contact all the time. Uh, yeah. Again, the, the similarities in our issues uh, just, just make it a natural fit for us to kind of bounce ideas off of each other and talk about, hey, did you hear this is going on over here or whatever else? Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's not, you know, there's CSEA and there's AME. It's there is labor. Oh, right. and this and is, we're going to do something. We're going to join forces with you uh, in May. You're doing your May Day again, a May Day Festival, and uh, and a Long Island Federation of Labor, which I'm executive committeeman on, and uh, we are all ready uh, to jump in and help and get to get involved. So I I can't wait to show the people in Suffolk County, and it, you know, there's, there's folks that are considering traveling out from the city. There's all the unions over there that are saying, "Hey, we're going to bring our members out there. Uh, we want the world to see what organized labor can actually do together." Well, you know what's good about what we did today and what you're doing and I'm doing is there's still this misnomer by the average uh, citizen that, the, you know, the big unions, uh, we control the pricing and we control this and that. Because if that's, we're public union workers. We're right. government workers. Right. They're nowhere near that. And they're still by, listen, most private unions don't, aren't like that anymore. There might have been a few, you know, a couple of decades ago. But, you know... Uh, Today, you don't have that kind of uh, power. You can't shut down jobs because the wrong guy pushed the button. That's the idea. They think that we got the power to right. shut down a $20 yeah. million dollar job no. because somebody else has right. to push that button. That's all nonsense. Okay? Yeah, yeah. You, folks, you got to forget that. And we're public workers. We're here to keep you, uh, your quality of life. That's our job is your quality of life in one way or another. If it's not 911 sure. and getting mm -hmm. in seven minutes or six minutes or less. If it's not, you know, the ambulances, if it's not the jails, unfortunately, where we got to keep the bad guys, you know, that's what we do. Yeah, listen, government is mandated to protect the health and the safety of its residents, and that's what government workers do, right? There are policy makers, there are a couple of administrative folks that sit around and say, I want this, or I want this, or maybe we should do it this way, or whatever. All the work that actually gets done, that improves your life, is done by workers. And I hope your members understand that, you know, we both of our unions have long histories. True. But, uh, without a doubt, and I can tell you this, in my lifetime, I think your union is on the right road. I think you, as a president, have been very instrumental in bringing it on the right track and going and protecting your members and working for your members, and that helps us all. So, I, again, I thank you again for all the hard work that you do as, as an AME president. You're doing a great job. I really I do appreciate that. You know, I try to keep it simple for myself. Uh, I look at it as what would I want the president to do if I wasn't the president? If I was back on the job, doing my job, yeah. what is it I want the president to do? And then if that thing is difficult, too bad for me, that's the thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do, right? So 
Uh, but Jerry, you know, I just I just want to check with you if there's any other any other things, any other priorities for government employees that maybe we didn't get to talk well, about. Well, one thing I would say is how uh, I don't know if we touched on this already in some way, but I think the shame of it is, um, and and this goes to politicians, right? So when we first started with this COVID back in really March of 2020 when it really got bad. And mm-hmm. it started maybe January, February. We really didn't recognize it for a while. Man, we don't know what's going right. on. So back then, you know, the politicians of all sorts from all areas of Long Island were calling hospital workers and essential workers heroes. We were heroes. All members mm-hmm. were heroes. Today, fast forward two years later, I'm representing half of them. We are representing half of them because they're in violation of COVID. They're in violation of taking too much time off because they go in quarantine. Uh, it's amazing how it's flipped over. And that is so typical of management. Yeah. You know what? I got to tell you, there was one thing that really blew my mind. And it wasn't in New York State, but there was a group of nurses that had had it with the, with the hospital they were dealing with. And they said, we're leaving this hospital and we're going to go work for another one. And, and the hospital went to a judge and made it illegal for them to quit their job and wow. go to another job. You talk about eroding workers' rights. This is the type of stuff that happened. Now, that did get overturned, but can you imagine a world where your employer says you're not allowed to quit? Wow. And you have to, yeah, you have to stay here. You can't go to a competing uh, organization to improve yourself. We fell from grace in the eyes of management only because why? I think, you know, as uh, Americans from coast to coast have grown tired and weary of this disease. Yeah. So to have uh, their feelings of who's helping them and who's a hero and who's zero kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? it's yeah. All, yeah. Huh? It's all like, all right, enough it's of the It's the same stuff. person, depending on what we're talking about. Yes, when it's their and profits. They only do things to get reelected. They yeah. say things to get reelected. Yeah. So if they're, if they're coming after our members now, oh, I, I have a member right now that uh, might lose her job because she's been no pay for about three months. But that's because she's a long-term you know, the COVID long-term effect. Yeah, right. She got COVID on the job. Right. And they're coming after her because she's no pay. She's losing her medical. And it's amazing. In a global health crisis, we're going to take away a frontline worker's medical. So Governor Hochul, you got to yeah. stop that. You yeah. got to, you know, you got to put another uh, proclamation out or whatever because Cuomo did do that in the beginning. Remember? Yeah, yeah. And Executive Order 202, yeah, right? Right, there you go. And then it ended. Yeah. So we need another one. <laughs> well, my guest this morning is Jerry Larracuta. He's president of CSCA Region 1. Jerry, uh, thanks again. It's always great to have you. And I, I feel like we could always talk two more hours. Yeah, yeah, right. No, you're right. So, we'll but, just do it again someday. That's all. Absolutely. As long as you'll have me, I'll always come. Yeah. <laughs> and to our listeners, we'll speak to you next week.